Episode 15, Double Shock, first aired March 25th, 1973. This is the final episode of Season 2. It was directed by Robert Butler, born 1927 in California. He directed quite a variety of television between 1960 and 1990, and he won an Emmy for his work on Hill Street Blues and The Blue Knight. The story was written by Jackson Gillis, writer of Suitable for Framing, Short Fuse, Dagger of the Mind, Requiem for a Falling Star, and The Most Dangerous Match. Parts of the story were also written by the creators of Columbo, Richard Levinson and William Link. But the actual teleplay was written by Stephen Bochco, writer of Murder by the Book, Lady in Waiting, Blueprint for Murder, and Etude in Black. And with so many writers involved, I get a bit suspicious about the quality of what I'm about to watch, so let's find out. Our episode begins playing a familiar tune originally composed for Dagger of the Mind. We've got a gloved man unwrapping some newspaper to reveal a handheld mixer. And what is oddly interesting about this little scene is it is sped up just a little bit as we watch him whittle the cord down to a bare wire. And then as soon as he starts walking, we go back to regular speed. Looks like we might be in a laundry room as the man grimly turns the mixer speed up to high and drops it in a tub of water, causing a flash and immediate scene change. Now we, as in you and I, are sparring with someone and I'm getting dizzy in the process. Well, here comes the mixer man into the room, passing by a blender with unknown liquids. He stops to watch the fencing with great and animated joy. Finally, the fencing business is over. Take care of the body, Mike, and the body takes care of you. Protein, Mike, protein. Oh, it's one of those people. On guard. Look, there's one of those sit in the box and sweat things. I wonder what this weird abacus looking contraption is for. Well, now that the fencing is actually over, they shake hands and are all jolly together. <laughs> Hi there, bridegroom, bridegroom. Uh, thanks, uh, how about that old guy? Is he wild? Is he wild? Why is he repeating his last few words? Bridegroom, bridegroom. Uh, is he wild? Is he wild? Maybe he has a disorder. Why don't you stop by, Dexter? Are you kidding? I wouldn't miss shaking hands with an old goat like you is good enough to snare a beautiful chick like... I think I've got it. Uh, it took me uh, a minute to connect with the word chick. Anyway, we learn this man is named Dexter Paris, and he is played by Martin Landau, born 1928 in New York. He was a pretty busy actor, and he loved being an actor. He will always be remembered for his role in the TV show Mission Impossible, but you can also find him in every episode of Space 1999, as well as the films North by Northwest, Decision at Midnight, They Call Me Mr. Tibbs, 1986 Treasure Island, Crimes and Misdemeanors, that one Pinocchio movie from the 90s, and Ed Wood, for which he won his Oscar, portraying Bela Lugosi. And when I watched it, I never even recognized it was him. He just looked like and sounded like and acted like Bela Lugosi. Now, Dracula, that's a role that requires talent. Of course! Dracula requires presence. It's all in the eyes and the voice and the head. You seem a little agitated. You want to go outside and get some air? I'm ready now. Roll the camera. I recommend that movie if you have a sense of humor and you need a little bit of encouragement to keep trying despite your failures. Your uncle is getting married tomorrow. My nephew stopped by to wish me well. So, this is Dexter's uncle, Clifford Paris, played by Paul Stewart, born 1908 in New York. He had roles in Citizen Kane, Champion, 12 O'Clock High, Kiss Me Deadly, 1967's In Cold Blood, Opening Night, and was the host and narrator of the TV drama Deadline. The stories that shock a nation, move them, make them laugh, begin here. The presses are rolling on Deadline. Clifford says he hoped Dexter might have brought his brother Norman with him. If Norman were to come, which I hope he does, by the way, it certainly would not be with me. You're two grown men, Dexter, for heaven's sakes. Then Dexter gives us a quick exposition, letting us know that this man is an attorney, and Dexter and his brother Norman are not friends at all and haven't spoken in years. In fact, Dexter calls him the most hurtful name of Beanbag. And my Beanbag brother... So the attorney man is named Michael Hathaway, played by Tim O'Connor, born 1927 in Illinois. He will always be best remembered as Elliot Carson in Peyton Place, appearing in 416 episodes. He was also in both the movie and TV show Buck Rogers in the 25th century. I'm almost afraid to ask, but we're... <laughs> what is this? A balloon. A balloon? 
Well, I take it there's some peculiar purpose in that. <sighs> They're for decorating. Dexter suddenly remembers he has something in the oven, so he leaves. Scene changes to the kitchen, with clear focus on an innocent hand mixer. Dexter pulls out of the oven what he calls Les Tartes Strabert à la Dexter Paris. Exactly as prepared on my little Thursday cooking show for all my hypoglycemic housewives. Hypoglycemic housewives? Well, hypoglycemic means you have low blood sugar, so that must be his funny little joke about how sweet these tarts are. This woman says his uncle would give those tarts a big nutritional zero and throw them in the garbage can. Right along with that TV show of yours. Why does every burner have a pot on it? I'll bet she's got the whole club aluminum cookware set. She tells him to get out of the kitchen so she can clean up this mess he made. We've also got the Lincoln Beautyware copper canisters, I think. Then they start discussing Clifford's bride-to-be. Well, I think it's disgusting, that's what I think. She's young enough to be his granddaughter. That snip. I've never heard of calling someone a snip, and the best definition I could find for it is a small or insignificant person. She goes on to say that she has been taking care of that man for 33 years and... Don't you know no one can do without you around here? Oh, you're soft soaping me. I am not. I've also never heard of soft soaping either, which means to flatter or tell someone what you think they want to hear. This woman's name is Mrs. Peck, played by Jeanette Nolan, born 1911 in California. Her debut as an actress was quite a significant one, as Lady Macbeth and Orson Welles' Macbeth. She was also in The Big Heat, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, and several episodes of The Virginian. Grants, when you finish the dishes, will you help Harry wait on tables? Sure. Papa! Washing dishes is enough for him. Who ever heard of a man waiting on table? An interesting uncredited role for her is the voice of Mother, or Norma Bates, from Psycho. I know movie fans all have their own choice for the best Hitchcock film, and I'd love to know your choice. I haven't seen every Hitchcock film, but for me, I think Psycho is the best one. Dexter takes one of the strawberry tarts with him and leaves as the music from the Greenhouse Jungle plays, which was also used in Requiem for a Falling Star. He gets into his 1967 Ferrari 330 GTS, and we are sure to see Mrs. Peck wave goodbye to Dexter. Mr. Hathaway finally leaves, and Clifford says to Mrs. Peck that he thought she was going to visit her sister tonight. She says she figured she should stick around in case he needed something. After all, I'm the only one who knows where everything is. Although I suppose your young bride-to-be won't need... Now, Mrs. Peck, you have been the mistress of this house, and you always shall be. He tells Mrs. Peck to lock up and go on, and then gives her a little Mrs. Peck on the cheek. She locks the front door and walks around the corner to set the security system. Then, entering a different room, she turns on the TV and puts her coat on for some reason and turns off the light. I don't think she's putting her coat on because she was actually intending on leaving to visit her sister because she immediately turned on the television. On the TV, we have a comically bad medical drama or something. You're also a doctor now, Rocky. And if you're not cold and hard and tough enough to justify the faith and confidence of your patients, you can hand me your stethoscope, Rocky, right now. These low camera angles crack me up. The young doctor, Rocky, is played by Mark Singer, born 1948 in Vancouver, Canada. This amazing made-up medical drama was his television debut. If you want to enjoy some more of his acting, check out the film The Beastmaster. And if you need a good laugh at a bad sequel, check out Beastmaster 2. And if you want another laugh at a worse sequel, check out Beastmaster 3. He was also in every episode of V. The senior doctor is played by Stanley Waxman, born 1914 in Ohio. He was in The Judge, Zombies of the Stratosphere, and eight episodes of the Richie Rich Scooby-Doo show. Then, a dark figure walks through the hall to turn off the security system, wearing the same black leather gloves that Dexter was wearing during the intro. And then, another dark figure outside is walking around in their socks. Oh, it's Dexter. Weird. How is he inside, but now outside, but inside? Well, anyway, he peeks in the window to see Mrs. Peck watching TV. Seeing only the back of her head gives me a little deja vu to Psycho when we first met Mother. And now we are suddenly watching Clifford happily wash his arm with a washcloth as Dexter just walks right in. Oh, Dexter, what a surprise. Hmm, that is one of the strangest reactions to someone walking in on you naked in the tub. Dexter walks closer, saying he forgot to give him his wedding present, and sets down Dr. Barry Mayfield's bag from a stitching crime that Dudek was borrowing in the most dangerous match. 
Clifford literally just sits there naked in his bath water while watching Dexter. I cannot understand why he isn't questioning Dexter or telling him to get out of here until he's done or any kind of reaction. You're not going to suggest that this is normal for them to hang out, literally, in the tub and make small talk? Dexter presents his gift to Clifford. Well, my, my goodness. My goodness is right. Then Dexter calmly leans over to plug in the mixer. And I think for any normal person, this is the point where you would unashamedly get out of the tub. Blend, mix, whip. Clifford continues to just watch him with a confused look on his face. Yes, this would be confusing, but it would also be very disturbing. And all naked embarrassment would go out the window as I jump out of the tub. But instead, this is Clifford's response. Well, I, I, I'm not very fond of appliances, but, but, but thank you. You're welcome. Uncle, you're going to get a real charge out of this. And Dexter tosses the mixer into the bathwater, giving his uncle a real good charge. It's hard to catch this without slowing the video way down, but the mixer actually sparks like a firecracker before it hits the water. Anyway, the power goes out because we blew a fuse. Whoa, what? Listen to that old clicker with metal buttons. That's pretty cool. Mrs. Peck hits the TV a little bit because that's what we used to do and then hurries over to the light switch as the TV turns back on. Dr. Werbel, you've had 30 years as a general practitioner. I'm new. I'm green. You're purple. What can I do? What can any of us ever do, Roger? Roger? Wasn't his name Rocky just a minute ago? Many of you may ask about this outlet by the tub and wonder why it's there or if it even can be there legally. Well, let's see. It might be there to plug in a radio or a little TV while taking a bath. And back in 1973, it was not against code for it to be there. But as of 1975, GFCIs became required by the National Electrical Code to be added to bathrooms. It makes me wonder if this episode played any part in this new requirement. Well anyway, black gloved Dexter turns the alarm system back on and walks away with his shoes on because now it's okay if you hear footsteps. Now here comes a 1972 Ford Custom Taxi. I'm going to pause the show right here because I wanted to talk about this mansion and this is I think the best view we have. This romantic Spanish colonial revival architecture house was designed in 1926 by Wallace Neff for Francis Marion and Fred Thompson, named the Enchanted Hill in Beverly Hills, California. Francis Marion was one of Hollywood's top screenwriters during the 1920s. Fred Thompson was one of the top cowboy action stars. This mansion was atop one of the highest points in Beverly Hills. Fred died pretty young from tetanus, and Francis sold the mansion soon afterward. This estate was bought and sold several times until a co-founder of Microsoft bought it in 1997 for 20 million dollars. Three years later, this man with too many dollars and no sense demolished the house and all of its outer buildings, leaving the hill barren, which is exactly how it looks today. Out of the taxi flies a hasty little lady asking the cab to wait because she'll only be a minute or two. She weirdly rings the doorbell and Mrs. Peck lets her right in. I am really curious how the security system actually works because it doesn't sound an alarm anytime this door is open. Dexter turned it on right before he left after the murder and Mrs. Peck just opened the door just now without turning it off. Mrs. Peck, how nice to see you. Is Mr. Paris ready? I'll tell him you're here. Oh, never mind. I'll just scoot on up. Mrs. Peck asks her to wait while she goes to fetch him because he may not be quite dressed. Well, Mrs. Peck, you're talking like we were a couple of children. <laughs> Clifford! Clifford! Well, she seems to have a lot of energy this evening. What is this odd bronze baby with an instrument on the wall? Rich people can be so bizarre with their decor choices. Are you decent? Well... Ready or not. She finds the tub empty and heads back downstairs. He's not upstairs at all. I even checked his bathroom. Man, what is she on? Mrs. Peck suggests he may be in the gym. I bet he said electric bicycle I got for him. Oh, isn't he absolutely adorable? <laughs> Here you are, you silly. Now why aren't you... Well, looks like Dexter managed to set up his uncle on this electric bike without him falling off to look like he just died there, I guess. This had to have taken him quite a while with 
All those stairs and getting him dressed and cleaning up the bathroom? Good thing that gripping medical drama was on TV so Mrs. Peck was oblivious to her surroundings. Scene fades to dear old healthy Clifford being wheeled out on a stretcher. And here comes Columbo with his poor antenna. Hey, Lieutenant. How are you? Well, Looks like Columbo was called out of bed for this. A detective asks Columbo if he's got a handkerchief for the weeping bride-to-be. You got one? Boy, poor Columbo can hardly get his eyes open. Who is she? Victim's, uh, fiance. Supposed to be their wedding night. Oh, isn't that all? What are you dying? Coronary. What are we doing here? Well, this is great. Columbo asking a question we often have. Wes called us hysterical, said something about uh, everybody's after the old fellow's money and that uh, he was too healthy to die like that. This is Detective Murray, played by Dabney Coleman, born 1932 in Texas. He was in 148 episodes of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, and every episode of Forever Fernwood, and every episode of Buffalo Bill, and every episode of the Slap Maxwell story, and every episode of Drexel's Class, and every episode of Madman and the People, and every episode of The Guardian. Have you seen any of those TV shows? He was also in the films 9 to 5, Tootsie, War Games, and The Beverly Hillbillies. Coffee, Violet. Now. Yes, sir. You have my handkerchief? No, she got it. Well, anyway, come on. Way to go through the motions, huh? I like these next couple sentences they left in as they walk away. Columbo asks if she kept his handkerchief, and Detective Murray doesn't know. What did she do? She kept it? I don't know. So now they are checking out the electric bike, and Mrs. Peck is telling her side of the story as Columbo takes a moment to relax, since he still has not woken up completely. Any idea at all what, what time that that would be? You must belong in some pigsty. Do you do that in your own home? And it takes Columbo just a moment to even realize what she's talking about. Dropping ashes. Dinking cigar. Stop that! You're rubbing it in! Oh, forgive me, ma'am. I didn't realize. I like the reaction of these two detectives in the background. You're rubbing it in! Oh, forgive me, ma'am. I didn't realize. You know, sometimes it's a habit. Columbo, not knowing exactly what to do, figures he'll get a tray to help the situation. What I'll do is I'll take this tray and I'll... Oh, now, come on, lady. That's just a plain old simple glass pitcher. You can pick those up anywhere. I guess her emotions were just a little high and sensitive after what happened tonight, so we'll let it go. Columbo heads upstairs to the huge double door bathroom. Can you imagine having such a big bathroom? And splashes some water on his face to help clear his head. Look at that faucet. Is it a fish vomiting water or some kind of other animal? Columbo dries his face, leaving the water running, and suddenly takes notice of something, as he messily hangs his towel, that only Columbo would find significant. There is a towel missing on the other rack, and here it is in the hamper. He feels it, recognizing that it is damp, checks the tub, and grabs a slick bar of soap, wiping his hand in his armpit. Something is not quite right in here, so he begins to straighten his tie as he leaves a cloud of smoke behind him. And downstairs is Dexter giving his innocent little testimony. I waved mm -hmm. goodbye to Mrs. Peck and drove away. I mean, he was as healthy as a horse when I saw him. He was in the gym, he was fencing. It's, it's inconceivable. I can't believe it. The detective taking notes here is played by Robert Rothwell, born 1930 in California. He was in El Dorado in several episodes of Lou Grant. Columbo politely asks if he can enter the room where Mrs. Peck is. May I come in? Nobody responds to him, and Mrs. Peck walks farther away. Columbo introduces himself to Dexter, and Mrs. Peck decides to apologize for her outburst earlier. Officer, I'm afraid I have to apologize for my conduct. I was very overbearing. Columbo explains to Dexter that he dropped some ashes, and the house is spotless upstairs and down. You I said upstairs. Well, now, ma'am, I am a police officer, and I deemed it reasonable to... That's one of Mr. Paris's towels that you have. Yes. Yes, it is. Columbo explains he used Mr. Paris's bathroom for only a minute to splash his face with some water, and he was very, very careful. What were you planning to do? Uh, dry your face on the way down the stairs? Was that your plan? No, no, I used that very nice hand towel up there. But this towel was in the hand, and damp. Mrs. Peck sharply explains that this house is always immaculate and that she never allows damp towels to remain in the hamper. I certainly do believe that, but um, this towel was in the hamper, I swear, and damp. Very damp. 
Detective Murray wants to speak to Columbo because he needs to know what to tell the coroner. I think you better tell him an autopsy. Well, that really catches Dexter's attention. What's this autopsy business? I am not signing any authorization for an autopsy. If it's still up to the lieutenant here, you understand? Why is it up to him? Look, now I'm sure there's nothing there. I think autopsy, Murray. Columbo then tells Detective Murray to check out the burglar alarm and windows and keep an eye out for footprints. Dexter is all worked up and wants to know why the sudden investigation. Columbo wants Dexter to follow him to the gym. Uh, that way you could, uh, you know, show me around without uh, Mrs. Peck getting upset again, you know what I mean? Now that they are in the gym, Dexter again wants clarification on why Columbo thinks an autopsy is necessary. What are a couple of things that bother me? He wants to know why he came down here to work out right before he was about to get married. The man had an insatiable appetite for life, for exercise. But he just got done fencing with his attorney. But the man was a health nut. Then Columbo tells Dexter there is something about his uncle's death that really bothers him. Dexter asks, you mean about the heart attack? And Columbo says, well, that's what's bothering him because he's not sure it was a heart attack at all. And that is why he's ordered an autopsy. He wants Dexter to follow him up to the bathroom to show him something. A damp towel in the hamper and a damp piece of soap in the soap dish. And then Dexter gets smart with Columbo. Brilliant. I mean, you've deduced my uncle took a bath. Detective Murray shows up, saying the doors and the windows all look okay with no signs of Jimmy work, but there was a footprint outside Mrs. Peck's window. Lieutenant, that footprint, whoever it was, was not wearing shoes, and it looks like he had flat feet. You can't believe that Mrs. Peck could do anything like that. No, I was never considering Mrs. Peck. Then Columbo wonders about that footprint outside. I thought flat feet were peculiar to your business, Lieutenant. You know, that's not true. I found a couple reasons why there is a flat feet stereotype for police officers. One, which sounds more like a myth, is that they used to walk everywhere all the time when they were on duty patrolling neighborhoods and such, resulting in flat feet. But the other seems a little more believable. During World War I and World War II, you could not enlist into the military if you had flat feet, because having flat feet can make it more difficult to run or walk from the extra stress placed on the ankles. So, the next best choice for a man or woman wanting to serve their country was to be a police officer. The military did away with this restriction around the time of the Vietnam War. In fact, I have never met a cop with flat feet. You take my feet. I have terrific arches. I like Columbo's attempt to look at Dexter's feet here, going on about his great arch and then wanting to innocently compare arches. Take off your shoe, compare your arch with my arch, you'll see what I mean. You see, now that's not a cop's arch. Lieutenant, let's compare arches. Dexter, seeing right through Columbo's charade, admits he does have flat feet. No kidding. Dexter laughs and says it's unbelievable how Columbo's trying to make it seem like there is foul play involved with his uncle's death. Well, you have to admit there's something peculiar. He asks why someone would do a whole bunch of fencing, come in here and take a bath, and then immediately head down to the gym to do some more exercise. I don't understand that. Do you understand that? Then Dexter re-enters the room? Norman! Oh, this is Brother Norman we finally get to meet. He's played by... well, never mind. Dexter introduces him as his loving brother Norman. Norman says he was informed by Mrs. Peck that Columbo is considering an autopsy. He suspects foul play from you. I think an autopsy might be a very good idea indeed. Pretend we are very identical twins. He too has flat feet. Now we are suddenly counting a huge amount of cash with helpful Mike Lowley keeping the books straight. So far we have seen Mike Lowley and Lady in Waiting carrying a thing, short fuse manning the door to the skylift, Blueprint for Murder, Waiting in Line, Etude in Black, Helping Out Mike the Mechanic, Requiem for a Falling Star as a Security Guard, and A Stitch in Crime as the Orange Juice Man. Anyway, the autopsy has been performed, and they found Clifford did not have ordinary heart failure. They call it uh, ventricular fibro fibrillation. Anyway, severe heart seizure, a strong blow, some kind of shock, things like that. I'm pretty sure the way you can confirm someone is suffering from ventricular fibrillation is with an EKG. And it is fascinating how the autopsy could show dead Clifford's heart rhythm. Amazing. This man trying to close the vault door is Dick Sondergaard, who we've met already as well in Blueprint for Murder and Etude in Black. What about tension or garden variety overexertion in, in a man his age? Back there is J. Loft Lynn, born 1912 in Pennsylvania. I forgot to mention him in the jury of Lady in Waiting. Like many of our friends in the background, his acting career was nothing but uncredited roles. Although he didn't make a career out of it, only showing up in a few different TV shows like The Wild Wild West, Kojak, 
and roots the next generation. Then Columbo calls Mr. Paris, Mr. Parks. I gotta tell you, Mr. Parks, I'd be a nervous wreck if I had to work around all this money. I mean, the responsibility. Maybe they just got done filming Requiem for a Falling Star. Oh, Mr. Parks? Yes? Uh, may I use your telephone? Norman defends himself by listing the reasons why his brother is the suspicious one, and he is innocent despite his uncle's death, meaning he stands to inherit half of the estate. Let me point out that I am wealthy, with neither wife nor darling kitties to encumber me, and if in fact I were possessed of a criminal mind, I would find it much simpler to embezzle than to kill my uncle for it. Norman says he has a flight to San Francisco to catch in 47 minutes and excuses himself. These were of course the days of walking into the airport and just finding your gate to catch your plane all within 15 minutes or something. Well, now we are in a new location, looking up at some apartment buildings. This building is located on Los Feliz Boulevard in Los Angeles, California. It looks very similar today. They left it alone, believe it or not. The only real difference that stands out to me is the palm tree was replaced with a different tree, and the cars aren't near as interesting. But anyway, this apartment is where, um, well, I don't know why... Robert Butler thought this particularly detailed view was necessary. But here we have Lisa Chambers being socially awkward, knowing full well Columbo is here to talk to her, but she needs to do this at this very moment. She calls it feeding the brain. I consider it essential to feed the brain twice a day. I hope you don't mind waiting. No, I enjoy watching. Oh, that's why Butler had her do this. The fellas enjoy watching. Well, why don't you come out here and I can hear you a little better. Oh, fine. So Columbo heads on over to the balcony to ask her a few questions. He was wondering how well she knew the twins. Next year I knew. The other one I think is a banker. Then she goes on about life force or what have you and that Clifford understood things like that better. He also understood our bodies. Oh, he loved our bodies. Okay. I guess people snickered at us a little. You know, spring in the lap of December. Spring in the lap of December is a romantic relationship between two people who have a large age difference. Spring would be the young person, and December the older person. This saying is more commonly just called a May-December romance. Then she stands here weirdly and whacks herself in the forehead while Columbo continues to attempt to question her. Columbo asks if Mr. Paris got along with his nephews, and what is going on over here? I can't even really guess what those are for. And I see she has the same wooden exercise abacus that Clifford had. Anyway, watch how instantaneous she puts her sweater on that she's holding. Did he prefer one to the other, or something like that? Oh, I don't know. Well, I don't know what kind of answers I'm supposed to give to this investigation. What am I, some kind of suspect? Well, you're about to be with that kind of attitude. Lisa Chambers is played by Julie Newmar, born 1933 in California. She was in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, McKenna's Gold, and every episode of My Living Doll, but is most famous for playing the Catwoman on the TV show Batman from 1966 to 1967. You're a rare lady, Catwoman. You're right on time. Columbo very kindly says, no, she's not a suspect at all. You make me very uncomfortable. Columbo apologizes and tries to tell her she doesn't even have a motive. If you two were married, then you'd stand to inherit all his money. That would be a motive. If I demanded that you leave this house right now, would you have to? Is there something that you're afraid that I might ask you about? She again says she requests on her rights that he leave her house, and so he does. Talk about being oddly defensive and suspicious. Now, moving on, we are in a live audience to Dexter Paris's cooking show. He talks up a hollandaise sauce he is about to share that is so simple, even the husbands can make it. He wants a gentleman volunteer to come up and help him with the demonstration. But since no man is volunteering, he picks one out. How about you, sir? This woman couldn't be more excited for Columbo than if it were her own child. Dexter encourages the crowd to clap as they walk to the kitchen. Dexter introduces Columbo to the crowd, informing them that he qualifies as someone's husband and gives an interesting summary of an American husband. This happens to be Lieutenant Columbo of the LAPD, who is your everyday, average, typical, downtrodden American husband. Don't you agree? And everyone claps at that for some reason. Dexter explains what we have on the counter today. This is a Dexter Paris number 91 multi-speed blender. We have four eggs, 
some salt, some pepper, some butter, and some lemon juice. Dexter takes off Columbo's raincoat and his jacket and gives him an apron. Columbo ties his apron around the front of his waist, and Dexter instructs him to separate the yolks from the whites and put them in the blender, while Columbo unbuttons and rolls up his sleeves. I'll take this half cup of butter and I will heat it in this frying pan. Now, uh, get cracking. Then Dexter laughs and tells Columbo he's on television, encouraging the crowd to clap again, and we'll hear Columbo crack an egg. All right, now, uh... But then the camera changes to Columbo rolling up his sleeves again, and Dexter telling him to get cracking. Uh, you better get cracking. Uh, Lieutenant. <laughs> I'll get cracking. Yeah. Right. Columbo happily cracks open the egg, and Dexter says, no, no, just the yolks. What do you mean just the yolk? No, no, you have to separate... The yolks from the whites, you see, by doing that. Put the yolks in there like that. Oh, I got it. When Columbo manages to do this, Dexter again encourages the crowd to clap, and the crowd is in love with Columbo or something. Dexter compliments Columbo, saying he must do some of the cooking at home. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> Uh. <laughs> Can't you say anything else, Lieutenant? Uh. <laughs> Where did all that lemon juice come from? There's like a cup and a half in there now. Where when we started, there was maybe a half a cup. And how many eggs have we cracked by now? Didn't Dexter say they had four eggs? We have four eggs. Uh. Get home. One more. I know, we're being a bit nitpicky here. It seems two scenes were filmed and then just edited together. Now Dexter has Columbo pour a load of lemon juice in the blender, and then there goes the butter with a dash of salt and pepper. <laughs> and Dexter just laughs his head off about the pepper, but I don't know why. Why do you turn on the blender? Right here? Right there. Then Dexter serves up some asparagus onto a plate and reaching over to turn off the blender. Now why don't we just take this off? Wanna hold it? Whoops. I said turn that off. <laughs> Looks like the Dexter Paris number 91 multi-speed blender is a bit faulty. <laughs> Magic! <laughs> oh! oh. I'm terribly sorry! Columbo gives it a taste and doesn't really care for it. Too much pepper, I think. Yes, you gorgeous gaggle of gals out there, it's time to say bye-bye, ladies. See you tomorrow. Now, there are a lot of extras in this audience, but I can only name one of them. This lady is Judith Woodbury, born 1922 in California, a lifelong uncredited actress. She was one of the many girls in Ladies of the Chorus, as well as showing up in several episodes of The Lucy Show. Now that the show is over, Columbo is sharing how nervous he was as Dexter unties Columbo's apron from behind, even though Columbo originally tied it in the front. I know you probably don't care. How about a topic that splits the Columbo fans in half? First, I will mention that this cooking show scene had very few instructions and was mostly improvised. And you can tell by the absurd amount of laughing and clapping to fill the silence. Many, many Columbo fans just love this cooking scene and say it's the highlight and most endearing moment in the episode. And some even go as far to say it's one of the best moments in Columbo history. Well, here comes one of my very individual moments because, in my opinion, the comedy is terribly forced and the scene is more silly than funny. I think this scene could have been funny if Martin Landau had played it straight against Columbo's mistakes and nervousness rather than laughing his head off and clapping. Anyway, got that out of my system. Columbo tells Dexter that his wife cooks all of his recipes. She's a big fan of yours. Columbo, as we know, regularly uses the technique of flattery when he's pretty certain he knows who the guilty party is. If he isn't a big fan of the person, his wife certainly will be. Although last episode, it was Columbo's nephew that was the big fan, wasn't it? You're the champion, aren't you? I want to say it's a great honor to meet you. I've got a cousin up there in Albany. He wears big, thick glasses, and he thinks you're the greatest thing in the world. The problem is, whenever she tries one of your recipes, it's a disaster. And she follows your instructions to the letter. I thought it was the equipment. Columbo gets very specific about small electrical hand mixers and wants to know what Dexter recommends. But Dexter says he's sorry he's not allowed to endorse any products. Then Columbo gets right down to the point. They've definitely established now that your uncle passed away from an electrical shock. I thought you should be aware of that. You mean from the exercise machine? No, I sent an electrician out there. Machine works absolutely perfectly. Columbo goes ahead to reveal that his uncle was certainly murdered. Dexter is immediately dismissive, saying this melodramatic sleuthing is driving him crazy. 
Columbus starts hinting at the idea that his uncle was in the bathtub and it's possible someone could have thrown in an electrical appliance while he was in there. You come in here with the subtlety of a train wreck and you ask me what electric mixers I use. My brother put Jeff to it, right? Columbo mentions talking to his secretary earlier and she said Dexter ordered up two brand new mixers last week. Dexter gets riled up and walks over to the counter, aggressively taking out the two mixers. One. Uh, this does prove that Dexter didn't use brand new mixers to electrocute his uncle, but they could certainly be replacements for an old murdering mixer as well as an old practice murdering mixer. Dexter is sure his brother Norman put the thought into Columbo's head that he was guilty while doing an imitation of him. Waiting for uncle to die so we can feed off his millions. Dexter says he could hurl the same defamatory remarks at him, but Columbo says Norman really doesn't seem to have much of a motive. Did he happen to tell you he was going to fly to San Francisco on a business trip? Yes, he did. You doing anything for the next couple of hours? Where are we going? I'm going to visit my brother, see his motive. And here we are, flying to Las Vegas, stopping at a view of the iconic Welcome to Fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada sign, which was designed and installed in 1959. In 2013, the sign was added to the State Register of Historic Places, and it is still in the exact same spot today in the median of Las Vegas Boulevard. But check out the drastic changes compared to 1973. You can't even see that mountain range back there anymore. That big building back there is the Mandalay Bay, opened in 1999. When I was in Vegas for a couple of days in 2018, that's where we stayed. Well, here's some poker players. I think we know two of them, don't we? Mickey Golden is here on the left from Suitable for Framing Twice, Lady in Waiting, The Most Crucial Game, Requiem for a Falling Star, and The Most Dangerous Match. He's got all sorts of hobbies, doesn't he? The other man here is Lynn Felber, who also has a lot of hobbies, starting in Lady in Waiting, Blueprint for Murder Twice, Dagger of the Mind Twice, Requiem for a Falling Star, and The Most Dangerous Match. Well, let's find out why we're here. See that second crap table over there? Recognize anybody? This is the San Francisco All right, trip. It comes here every Wednesday in rain or shine, in sickness or in health. Dexter says if Columbo liked the last impersonation he did of Norman, he's gonna love this. Well, well, Mr. Paris, what can I do for you today? This gentleman is willing to advance me sufficient funds to help me diminish my indebtedness to this estate. Just one minute. Columbo, playing along, first asks how much he owes before he loans him anything. We have markers from Mr. Paris totaling $37,500. Evidence. This lady is named Mrs. Johnson in the credits, but we are never given her name in the episode. She's played by Kate Hawley, born 1946 in Kentucky. She was in eight episodes of The Bold Ones. Then Dexter leads Columbo over to the crap stable, where Norman is losing all of his money. Dexter waves at him, and Norman is shocked and embarrassed to see that Columbo is here. This man who gets to be in the center of the shot is Leland Sun, born 1950 in New York. I forgot to mention him in the background of Suitable for Framing at the art show. He was in the films Big Trouble with Peter Falk, as well as several episodes of M.A.S.H. He also did some stunt work in Big Trouble in Little China and Beverly Hills Ninja. Dexter makes a bet, and the man that takes his money is played by Joseph LaCava. We have already met him as the medical examiner in both Murder by the Book and The Greenhouse Jungle. You care to make a bet, sir? Watch your hands. Care to Make a Bet, Sir is played by Tony Cristino, born 1936 in New Jersey. He had a very light acting career, showing up in an episode of Barnaby Jones and M.A.S.H. Now we are back at the Clifford Paris household, and inventory is being taken on his valuables, with Columbo making little comments about how beautiful these statues and artifacts are. Beautiful. Just beautiful. Beautiful. Just beautiful. Notice how Columbo is keeping his left hand cupped as an ashtray for his cigar in the presence of Mrs. Peck. I didn't all go to the stuff for you. Know. please. Columbo asks if Mr. Hathaway was close to the nephews. No, not really. Dexter is useless. Norman's rather pompous. It's a shame that the two brothers don't get along like that. Which one of them do you suspect? Columbo says he's very heavy on motives, and they both seem to have pretty good motives. Hathaway asks if Columbo visited Lisa Chambers, and Columbo admits she was acting kind of strangely and wondered if she had any reason to help either of the two brothers. I don't think she even knows them. Columbo thanks Hathaway and says they are going to check out every possibility. Uh, including myself, I trust. We checked out where you went after your fencing match with Mr. Paris, and you really couldn't have killed anybody from that attorney's banquet. Hathaway tries to be funny by saying it was so flattering that he was considered, and I love Columbo's response to him. Of course, you could have had him killed. 
But I really don't put you very high on the list of suspects. Nice talking to you, sir. Then Columba puts his cigar out, and Mrs. Peck happens to notice where he put it out and blows up at him. You're a bum! What are your stinking cigar butt in this silver antique dish? <laughs> I thought it was an ashtray. By the way, this hideous ape statue. What in the world? Back in the kitchen, Mrs. Peck is vigorously shaking some silver cleaner or polisher into a rag. Columbo comes in to have a word with Mrs. Peck. Oh, I don't expect you to like me, but I have feelings too, Mrs. Peck. I'm sorry about being untidy. If you keep on treating me like I'm an enemy just because I'm here trying to find who killed the man that you worked for, well, then I think you're a very unfair person. After Mrs. Peck doesn't say anything to him, Columbo begins to leave the room. But then hard-hearted Mrs. Peck finally feels guilty for her behavior and calls for Columbo to offer him a peace offering. I would like to offer you a plate of Mr. Paris's favorite health cookies and a glass of milk. Well, thank you. I'm extremely fond of health cookies. It's so funny how sincere he says that. The scene fades to show some time has passed with Mrs. Peck describing the night Clifford was found dead. Columbo asks her if she remembers anything small or insignificant that happened, like a noise or something. Well, the TV there went off. The TV went off? She says it was only off for a few seconds and then it came back on again, but the color hasn't been the same since. Well, you know, I'm an expert on fine tuning. What I mean is, you know, I know what those repairmen get. Uh... Columbo says he knows how much the repairmen charge because he was stung a couple of times by them. So he went down to the supermarket and bought one of those instructional manuals to really study up on it. So if you don't mind, may I take a look at this? Let me see what I can do for you. Do you remember exactly when it was that the set went for me? And it was 8.05 exactly. So Columbo starts putting his instructions manual studies to work. All you have to do is get the precise thing. Is... Oh, dear. Wait a minute. Oh, well, now, remain calm. This is just, I'm Ouch! very happy to pay for something. Oh, yes, man, I'm going. Now that that's over, we are now hearing some surprising news from Hathaway to Norman about his uncle's will. Leaving the bulk of the estate not to you or your brother, but to Miss Lisa Chambers. This leaves Norman speechless and blinking for a while. Hathaway has his own scheme thought up, assuming Norman or Dexter did murder their uncle. So if either one of you killed him, it's all for nothing, because the money goes to the girl. Unless, of course... Uh... Go on, please. Hathaway says there are only three copies of this will in existence. His copy, Clifford's copy, and Lisa's copy. I might be able to persuade the lovely but not too brilliant young lady into giving me her copy for safekeeping. This fireplace and room are awfully similar to Leslie Williams in Ransom for a Dead Man and Aunt Dory's in Short Fuse. For a moment, I was certain it was the same, with the identical wood panels, built-in bookcases, and these little urn trophy things. But this fireplace seems much bigger than the one in Ransom for a Dead Man and Short Fuse, so... Never mind. There go no copy of any will being found. The estate descends to you and your brother. Norman wants to know what the catch is. Hathaway explains he simply wants to retain his services as business manager and as attorney. The scene immediately cuts to Dexter saying he will only agree if he physically gets the copy away from Lisa. So Hathaway fearlessly picks up the phone and calls her. Lisa's bat phone rings and she answers. The Batman should know about this immediately. Hello. Uh, Miss Chambers, this is Michael Hathaway. Do you have a moment? I'm listening. Hathaway says he has certain sources in the police department who feel she is a prime suspect in Mr. Paris's death. That I know, but I didn't do it, Mr. Hathaway. Of course you didn't. If the police should ever find that copy of the will Mr. Paris made out. I never wanted the money. Hathaway says the police would never believe her and that they are running out of time. He says the wisest thing to do is for him to come pick up her copy of the will for safekeeping. Lisa agrees and thanks him. I can be at your apartment at five o'clock. Thank you. And Dexter goes ahead and signs the contract. Now Hathaway is at Lisa's apartment, with the music from the most crucial game playing. He rings and knocks, but no one is answering the door, so he lets himself in and looks around, kind of confused. Miss Chambers. He looks down at the coffee table and sees her copy of the will as the sound of sirens rings in the distance. He stuffs it in his pocket and about to leave, but sees the balcony door is wide open and he is compelled to check it out. Glancing over the balcony, we see a terrible sight of dead Lisa Chambers on the concrete and people gathering around as a policeman tries to keep them at bay. Look at him. 
Vultures. And unfortunately for Hathaway, he peeks over the balcony at the perfectly wrong time as a man points up and sees him. I think Tim O'Connor does a really convincing job acting in this scene. Actually, he's really good throughout the entire episode. He hustles out of the room and mashes the elevator button to get out of here. As the door opens, he runs face to face with a cop. Sir, may I ask which apartment you came from? And he knows he is in a mess now. Now we're back at Dexter's house with Columbo, who says Hathaway claims he was set up by Dexter, and of course Dexter denies it. Columbo says since Dexter knew what time he was due to visit Miss Chambers, all he had to do was get there ahead of him, wait until he saw his car arrive, and when he knew that he was in the elevator, shove the lady over the balcony, disappearing down the back stairs and all the commotion. Wrong. Well, he was very insistent, Mr. Paris. He woke up half the police station. He was very loud, very vocal. You wouldn't believe the noise that he made. Columbo takes out the agreement, retaining Hathaway as business manager and attorney for the estate. I see here your brother signed it. We thought we were inheriting my uncle's estate. I thought you'd never talk to your brother. And I talked to my brother today for the first time in over two years on the phone to discuss the signing of that agreement. Dexter explains that he figures the story goes like this. Hathaway and Lisa made a deal, and she killed his uncle Clifford. Lisa probably tried to cross Hathaway for some reason or other, and he shoved her off the balcony. While Dexter is talking, Columbo does his looking up at the ceiling thing when an important thought occurs to him. I like that Dexter looks too. Columbo says goodnight and leaves. Now back to Mrs. Peck watching her odd TV show of faces without a background. I'm new. I'm green. Tell me what can I do for this client? What can any one of us ever do, Tony? This young lawyer is played by Michael Richardson, born 1946 in California. He can most frequently be found in the TV series Chase. The other lawyer man is played by Gregory Morton, born 1911 in New York. He can be found in several episodes of Peyton Place, Perry Mason, and Ben Casey. Oh, we can be grateful, I suppose. And the TV goes off again. Lieutenant Columbo! Columbo is conducting an experiment today about how long it takes him to go from Clifford's bathroom down to the electrical panel in the basement, while Mrs. Peck yells at him the whole way. Do you hear me? He switches the fuse and walks away. Man, check out this basement. It's incredible. As soon as Columbo passes by Mrs. Peck, she starts Mrs. Pecking at him about her television set. She walks back into her little room and sees the screen has gone purple again. In the next scene, some time had to have passed because now Columbo is arriving at the mansion that he was already at in the last scene. He gets out and sees the TV repairman truck and figures he better get rid of his cigar. Dexter's Ferrari is also here. Columbo slowly approaches the door. I want to pay the repairman for you. I want to pay everything. Right now, while the man is still here, I'll pay it. Please, would you let me in? And she does let him in. Then we see Dexter and Norman talking about who gets what artifacts and belongings of their uncle. Now, yes, we know these are both the same actor, and back then, this was very convincing that they were speaking to each other. Director Robert Butler worked for Disney in the past, so he understood the twins' technique. Mrs. Peck lets them know Columbo is here. There's that disturbing pale ape again. Yes, Lieutenant, what is it this time? Well, to tell you the truth, I came here, I think, to make an arrest. You think? Well, it's a little bit complicated. Would you mind too much coming with me to the bathroom? As Norman follows Columbo, we see the double playing Dexter, and he looks so uncomfortable. He is squeezed into this tan jacket and walking stiff as a board. Now Columbo is in Clifford's tub, and he asks Norman to try and lift him out of the tub. What do you mean, lift you out of the tub? Yes, sir, if you could please try. So Norman tries as Dexter laughs, but he can't get a good grip on him. I can't. It must be the angle I have. That's right, sir. And you'll notice, sir, that I'm perfectly dry. I'm not even slippery. I mean, I have my clothes on. Then Columbo turns the water on for the bath. You'll notice we have some matching faucet hardware with the sink. Do you intend to demonstrate drowning yourself for us, Lieutenant? Oh, aren't you funny, Dexter. Columbo just says no, but he can demonstrate that their uncle could have died from an electrical shock. I think everybody should stand back for a moment. I'm not overly expert on electrical equipment. Sounds like he needs to make another stop over at the supermarket and pick up that instructional manual for electrical equipment. So he plugs in the mixer and says, suppose your uncle was taking a bath and someone came walking in. Norman is like, are you really suggesting someone just sauntered into the bathroom carrying an electric mixer? Well, I'm just using this mixer. I mean, anything electrical is what I'm trying to show. Now. Here we go. And the mixer sparks just before hitting the water. I'd really love to know how they rigged up the mixer for this episode, and they did such a good job with their timing. And Mrs. Peck's TV goes out again. Columbo rushes the group down the stairs and, oh look, there's Detective Murray. 
Where'd he come from? There's the same double again, but dressed uncomfortably as Norman. This is a pretty old house here, as you know, and when they have those old type fuses, the screw in kind, right here. A waiting policeman screws in the new fuse. 67 seconds exactly. Fascinating. I didn't know that. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Paris. I think he did know that. You know what bothered me? What bothered Columbo was how the murderer got into the house after Mrs. Peck switched on the burglar alarm. It would have been necessary for someone to let the murderer in. Well, that lets me off, I guess, huh? I'm afraid not, Mr. Paris. Columbo says he is the one who stayed inside and waited to turn off the burglar alarm. Mrs. Peck, did you or did you not see me drive out of here, wave goodbye, honk my horn? No, sir. She saw him. Columbo says he thinks Norman had the same clothes on as Dexter, and that he was the one who drove off and came back later for Dexter to let him in. Are you nuts? I'm very curious how Columbo knows which one drove off and which one stayed. Columbo brings up the fact that these two claimed that they never talked, except for the signing of that agreement the other day. But you know, that's what nailed you down. I called the telephone company. They told me that you two have talked maybe 20 times in the last 10 days. Then Columbo jumps back to how long it takes to get from the bathroom to the electrical panel. It took us 67 seconds to get down here and replace that fuse. But Mrs. Peck's television set was only out for 15 seconds. He says there just had to be someone else waiting down here in the basement to replace that fuse and somebody had to help lift the body out of the bathtub, then dry him off, dress him up in a sweatsuit, and carry him down all those stairs. Stop it! It's all right, Mrs. Peck. What's done is done. What's obvious is obvious. I'm just sorry that you had to be here. Shut up! And Norman is the one who surrenders first, but Dexter lets his head hang as he quietly leaves, too. Columbo gently leads Mrs. Peck out of the basement, and the episode ends along with the end of season two. Can you believe it? How about I immediately rate Double Shock? I'll give it a good four cigars out of five. I think the identical twin conundrum is an interesting twist, and it makes for a pretty good episode. Double Shock holds a real mystery for the first time viewer. It's not until the final scene that crucial elements of the murder and the identity of the murderer are really revealed. This is one of the very few episodes where we, the viewer, don't know the actual identity till the end, which was Dexter, I think, right? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Dexter. But of course, they are both equally guilty in this scenario. Here's another opinion that slices the double shock viewers in half. Mrs. Peck. It seems people either love her or really don't like her. Just like I had my own little suggestion for what I think would have improved the cooking scene, I also have a super simple suggestion for the Mrs. Peck storyline. I don't mind her very first outburst about the ashes in the carpet, but all the other short-tempered yelling she did throughout the episode at Columbo was a little overdone. And remember, that's just me and my opinion. Maybe you wanted her to keep finding reasons to throw a fit at our gentle detective. Imagine how much yelling she must have done while raising Dexter and Norman. No wonder they turned out the way they did. As mentioned, many say the cooking show was the best moment in the episode, but I, being a very individual person. You're a very individual person. I think the best moment is Columbo's reaction to the TV repair van. Wonderful, subtle performance by Peter Falk. Oh, you said you want to know Martin Landau's height? Okay, well, he, he was standing at six foot one inch. Now, I'd like to share the filming order of season two because it is definitely not in the order that was presented to us. The first episode filmed was episode 13, A Stitch in Crime. Then episode 8, A Tude in Black. Episode 9, The Greenhouse Jungle. Episode 10, The Most Crucial Game. Episode 12, Requiem for a Falling Star. Episode 15, Double Shock. Episode 11, Dagger of the Mind. And episode 14, The Most Dangerous Match. There were two working titles for Double Shock, and they are Recipe for Dying and Murder Times Two. And in Finland, it was titled Gemini, which is interesting. If your country called this episode something else, please share it in the comments because you know how much I enjoy that. Oh, and one more thing. Columbo never lights a cigar in this episode either. We're keeping track of those episodes, you know. Stay tuned for season three, starting off with Lovely But Lethal. That sounds intriguing, doesn't it? 
Now to those of you who stick around to the very end of my videos, I have an announcement to make. In about a week or so I am moving, and if any of you have ever moved to a new location, you know how much is involved in such an event and how much time and work goes into it. My situation has an extra little element to it though. I am moving out into the country. Yeah, way out. Huh? And the old country house will not have electricity for just a little while because the previous owners were Amish. So what I'm trying to say is that there will be an extra long waiting time between this video and the beginning of season three. Please don't be mad at me. I promise you I'm going to continue making Columba videos. I am not leaving. I'm just going to temporarily be missing while I set up house and home. I'll eventually make a post too for the folks who don't stick around past the episode ratings. There's a surprisingly large amount of them. So thank you for being here and listening and for being such a wonderful crowd of people. I am thankful for each and every individual person that stays here with me. You're a very individual person. See you soon-ish.